Institute Oncology Data Advisor. Today we're here live at the ASCO annual meeting in Chicago, and I'm joined by Dr. Eric Yonash. Thanks so much for coming on today. Yeah, thanks. It's great to be here. So, Rob, would you like to introduce yourself and share a little bit about what you do? Yeah, I'm a professor of medicine in the Department of GU Medical Oncology at uh, UTMD Anderson Cancer Center, and I run a VHL clinic, also see patients with advanced renal cell carcinoma, uh, have a lab, and also run several research consortia. Awesome. So we're really looking forward to the webinars that you're chairing with i3Health um, in June and July, um, entitled Comprehensive Management of VHL Disease, Genetic and Oncological Perspectives. Um, so what are the things that you're looking forward to discussing during these webinars? Yeah, I think it's really important with VHL disease to understand the biological underpinnings. Why does it happen? How does it affect individuals? And what can we do about it? So I think those are the three guiding principles of the, uh, of the presentation. Absolutely. I think it'll be a really educational talk. Um, so is there any notable VHL research that's being presented at ASCO this year? At ASCO this year, no. Um, one thing that we did present that uh, is of some interest is we looked at retrospectively in a uh, claims database mm -hmm. to see whether or not we can get an idea of what the impact of having a VHL diagnosis with hemangioblastomas is on uh, on these on these individuals. And so we uh, we looked in here identify. So one of the challenges in, in looking at a claims database is identifying who truly has VHL disease. And we came up with an algorithm to identify those individuals. And then we asked the question of whether or not these individuals used a different amount of pain medication compared to control populations, whether they had uh, an increase in imaging compared to control populations, and also whether they had an increase in provider appointments compared to control populations. The answer was yes, they did. And so just basically showing that uh, indeed individuals with VHL disease and hemangioblastomas definitely have to consume more healthcare resources than the average person. Absolutely. Um, in light of these uh, results that you found in the study, um, are there anything that is there anything that clinicians should counsel their patients about, or any um, any implications for these results? Not really. I think it's more from a standpoint of looking at the overall mm -hmm. burden of this disease on an individual, and then also thinking about potential alternatives because we do have Bilzidafen that's now approved, and it raises the the question of whether or not at least in some of these parameters, by using Velzodafan earlier, could we decrease, for example, chronic pain because we're not going to have to have as many surgeries for these patients? Um, could it also change the, the other uh, healthcare provider visit frequency because they don't need them as much? Absolutely. Um, speaking of Velzodafan, would you like to tell us a little bit about um, some of the recent data that has been published about it? Yeah, so Belzudafan is a HIF-2 alpha inhibitor, and uh, basically what happens is in the renal cell carcinoma cell, you have broken BHL that results in upregulation of HIF-2 alpha, which results in transcription of a whole bunch of things that are good for those cells, but not necessarily good for the person. Mm -hmm. Belzudafan will block HIF-2 alpha's interaction with HIF-1 beta, therefore it can't act as a transcription factor. You get de decreased transcription. So that's how the drug works, and uh, we've demonstrated with publications and follow-up publications uh, for von Hippel-Lindau disease that we have consistent effects on renal cell carcinomas, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, and hemangioblastomas. And more recently, in advanced renal cell carcinoma, publications have come out both in the phase one setting as well as now in a registrational setting, showing that this drug is superior to control agents like Everolimus, and it was FDA approved in December of 2023. Very exciting that, that it received approval. Um, so since this webinar um, is also going to be directed towards genetic counselors, would you like to talk a little bit about um, the role of genetic counselors um, for patients with VA disease? Yeah, it's critical, number one, for an individual to undergo genetic testing, they really need to know what the implications of the testing are, and the genetic counselors are very well equipped to provide that information. Number two, genetic counselors are very good at recognizing patterns within patients and their families to determine what the right testing is. And then the third thing is that if the testing is positive, it's critical then to look at other family members to determine what type of reflex testing should occur. So these are just three of the many other things that genetic counselors do for the patients, and uh, they're a critical part of the overall package here. Absolutely, definitely a very critical role. Um, so for these two webinars that are occurring on June 26th and July 11th, um, why should listeners attend, and what are some of the things that they can look forward to hearing about? Yeah, well, if they're interested in the biology of VHL, interested in how to manage VHL, 
interested in, in how to, what new therapies are available for VHL disease, then uh, these webinars are really going to be helpful. Wonderful. We're looking forward to uh, hearing more during them as well. So thanks so much for stopping by to uh, talk about this with us today and uh, looking forward to hearing more in the webinars. Thank you.